Mark chapter 5. For the last couple of weeks, we've been in one day of ministry of Jesus with the parables and teaching with parables, teaching the, the crowds. We've seen the crowds come. Uh, we've seen them even react to the point they were concerned for one another. They weren't concerned for him. All they knew was there was a miracle worker there. That's what they wanted. Now, he pushed, pushed out in the boats and stayed out in the boats so that they could hear him teach. He teaches in parables. And, and that is so that those who really don't want to hear go away. They don't care. They don't understand. They don't understand the parables. They don't really care to understand the parables, only his disciples. And, and probably more than just the 12. We're not going to limit the disciples to just the 12. But only his, well, and because last week when we saw the storm, he gets in the boat with those guys, and then there's other smaller boats following them. So, but only his disciples are coming to him and saying, explain these things to us. And so we've talked about that. If you're really a follower of Jesus Christ, you're not just sitting here on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or some other Bible study time and just listening to the words and being polite and being, uh, uh, you know, just a, not a distraction or whatever, however, just checking off the, the box for the week. It's not just part of your routine, but you're actually seeking to hear the Lord. You're looking for him. You want to hear his words. You want to understand. And so you go from even here and say, all right, I'm not sure what the pastor was saying, but explain it to me. And first John, John tells us that uh, we have the anointing, the Holy Spirit in us to teach us, to help us to explain it. We'll ask him if we're truly seeking the truth of God and, and how his, you know, and, and wanting his word to speak to us, we're going to go after it. And one of the things that, that's been pointed out in Mark is that Jesus, Mark just shows Jesus on the move all the time. He doesn't just sit in one spot and wait. In fact, in the beginning chapters, we saw him at Peter's house and, and he was doing many miracles. And then he went out to pray and the, the, the 12 came and found him or, or whoever was with him at the time came and found him and said, hey, there's a lot of people here that were, are wanting to see you. And he said, no, we need to move on. We need to move over here. We need to keep going. And so God is, is always moving. Our God is not a stagnant God. If a church becomes stagnant, if a Christian becomes stagnant, it's not God's fault. If our lives walking with the Lord, well, if our lives become stagnant, we're not walking with the Lord. If, if we don't know that God is doing something in our lives, it's because we're the ones sitting still, not him. And Mark is, is like that. Mark has shown a long day of, of high pressure, a big demand for uh, Jesus to... Uh, perform for Jesus to minister. And then he says, let's get in the boat and go. We're going to go to the other side. With a crowd standing there on the seashore, still wanting to, to be ministered to. I need my touch. I need my healing. I need my whatever. And he says, all right, we're going to the other side. And then we looked at that last week, and they're into this big storm. And Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. And the disciples are scared to death. I mean, some of these guys are fishermen. They make, they make their living on this sea, on the Sea of Galilee. They've been there probably in storms before. But whatever is going on with this storm, it's scaring them to death. To the point where they wake him up and say, don't you care, we're going to die. You know, it's not that it was raining so hard or even just that the wind was blowing that the ships or the boats were filling up. This is waves coming into the boat. This is, you can't bail fast enough. And they're thinking they're going down and they, and they wake Jesus up. And I'm sure Jesus is wet. It's not like, you know, the rain's afraid to touch the Lord. He's in the back of the boat. He's getting wet and he's so tired. We see a glimpse of his humanity. 100% God, but 100% man at the same time. And, and we see a glimpse of that in that he's so tired, he's sleeping through this storm. 
probably with, with water splashing even in, on him. And they wake him up. They cut his nap short and wake him up. But then he just says, peace be still. And the wind and the waves ceased. And it was a great calm. And he says to them, why, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And I'm, I'm not sure if he's speaking to their fear of the storm. We kind of always assume that, right? They're so afraid. They're, they're waking him up. We're going to. We're going to die, don't you care? And, and then he stops the storm, but the storm stops so fast that they're more afraid of the calm than they are of the storm. So that question maybe isn't so much, why were you afraid of the storm? Being afraid in a storm is, is understandable. Being afraid in, in a desperate or in high chaos times in her life that's that's understandable it's being afraid and to calm being afraid when he actually answers your prayer that's when he's like why don't you have any faith you asked you woke me up right? you, you cut my nap short I answered your prayer. Why are you still afraid? And I think sometimes we're, we're still afraid and maybe more afraid because this might demand more of me than I thought it was going to. This is maybe a little scary. I, I've asked for this. And now he's moved and moved in a, a greater way than I thought. And, and now, I, now I'm really afraid. Of it. What do I do with this? And they said, verse 41 says, they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I mean, it didn't just calm down. It didn't ease down. They went from high seas to dead calm right now. I don't think there was a little splash left on the water. Shake me. That would shake me. I've, you know, I've been following Jesus for a long time. I'm, I'm still not sure I'd be jumping up and down the boat saying, yes, that was cool. I don't think I would do that. I think I would be, oh, man, I just got reminded of who I'm following, and I'd be in the bottom of the boat. To see that happen. There are things that we see that, that God does in our lives and, and we're just tickled by them, right? We're, we're happy. We look at what God's doing. We're excited. But there are times. There are times when God moves, when he makes his presence known in such an extreme way that we don't want to breathe. We're not even sure we can breathe. Well, to make things, I don't know how you want to look at this, for better or worse, they've gone across the Sea of Galilee. And it says, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. This is a place where Gad had, had settled, the tribe of Gad had settled. Now, where they pushed off from, where they were ministering from, the land is pretty flat and it's more like a beach there. It's, it's you know, you just walk up to the water, walk off the water. But on the other side, it's, it begins, as you go around the sea, it begins to get steep. And where exactly they were at is very steep. Like a wrong step and you're falling into the water. You're not walking down to the water. So keep that in mind as we see this, this story is going to be familiar to you if you've been following the Lord for very long. And you've been in the Bible for very long. So he goes to the Gadarenes. Is when he when he had come out of the boat, immediately there were there met him 
out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him not even with chains because he had often been uh, bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces neither could anyone tame him and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones so you go from a raging sea. Well, <laughs> you go from a mob mentality crowd that's pushing in so hard you have to get in a boat and, and move out to where they can't get to you. Then you go across the sea and you go through this raging storm and then the Lord wakes up and dead calm. And now you come to an area where the first one that meets you is a man possessed. And we get a little background on him. Now, in, this is told in Matthew. This is told in Luke. In Matthew, it says two men met him. Now, all three of the Gospels only deal with what happens to one. So we don't know what happened to the second man. You know, if he just ran away and, and, and was not touched by the Lord. But all three of them only deal with one guy. And it seems to probably be the worst of the two, maybe. And so we, we see this background. <clears throat> right? He comes out immediately. They're out of the tombs, and, and it says, just as he starts off with, he just has an unclean spirit. When we get down farther, we find out there's a lot of them in there. He said he dwelled in the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. So he had been bound with chains before. I think Luke says he'd even been placed under guard before. So they would, they would bind him up. They'd have guards standing there. He would break these chains to pieces, and the guards, I'm sure, just fled for their lives. His whole life was intimidation and fear and terror and striking that into anybody who was by. And I think as Luke also though, tells us, he, he was like this for a long time, but before this, he had a life. He, he had a family. He had friends. We're going to see. Jesus is going to tell him, go back and tell your friends. So he had a life before this possession. It's not like he was possessed from the time he was a child. It's not like he just had a mental health issue. He's possessed by demons. Now think about this. There are at least four guys in this little group that have made their life on that sea. Before Jesus, they, they have been fishermen. They've been on this little body of water. And it's a little body of water. It's not a big body of water. It's not like, you know, you're going out into Lake Michigan and, and, and fishing. This is pretty small. In fact, you probably could hear somebody carrying on like this in the night. And most of the fishing we know went on at night. Can you imagine? Being in the shallows, throwing your fishing nets out, and if this guy's running around in the mountains and in the tombs, screaming and crying out to hear that come across the lake, come across a body of water. To be afraid to even maybe go over there and fish. Because you know, you're not far off the shore when you're fishing. You don't... What would that sound like? And you know it's in an area where there are tombs. So that just adds to all the superstition of what's going on over there too. And to hear that, not only that, we're going to find out that in this area that they're raising pigs. Now, I have a big pig farm right behind my house. And all hours of the night and day, you hear the screams and the yells from the pigs. And it's not because they're being mistreated or tortured and tormented back there. It's because they're being fed. We, we can tell when the feed starts rolling in because they go crazy, man. I mean, it's loud. It sounds like somebody's being tortured and tormented back there. But they, if you've ever heard pigs, when they get excited, it doesn't sound like something's excited. It sounds like something's dying a slow death. 
and it's loud, and you can hear it across the field. And I've not been to the Sea of Galilee, so I don't know how far actually it is across. I'm, I mean, I, I'm assuming you can see across it. So I'm assuming you can hear across it if you really had a loud noise. So on top of pigs who are unclean and all the carrying on that they do all on their own, and you have now a couple of crazy guys in the tomb, what is going on over there? And you come to this shore, and I, I, I'm imagining these guys are already questioning their destination. But they are with Jesus, right? He just calmed the storm. He just freaked them out with that. He is in charge of creation. And then this guy comes right out immediately, runs right to him. And that's the first thing they see, the first encounter they have. There's no big, no, no big crowd there waiting for Jesus. The news hasn't run around the sea first and and now all the all the cities have brought their sick and their lame and that's not what happens. You meet two guys according to Matthew and only one that you actually interact with with the according to all three of them really. And verse six says when he saw Jesus from afar he ran and worshipped him. The man possessed saw Jesus coming and ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So he cries out with this loud voice. And he says, What do I have to do with you? And Son of the Most High God, that's a term of, of deity. That's not a, that's not just a title where, you know, I'm a son of God, you're a daughter of God or a son of God. It's not like that. These demons recognize Jesus as God. It's a, it's a divine term. What do I have to do with you, son of the most high God? And, and in one of the accounts, it says, have you come to, to send us away or have you come to torment us before the time so they know their time they know their time has an end their ability to have any control over anybody to influence humanity at all has an end coming and it's interesting to know they knew it wasn't then The idea that our enemy does not know the plan is is a, a foolish way of looking at it. Maybe not all the details. Certainly he doesn't know the day or the hour that Jesus comes to collect his, his bride, his church, any more than we do. But he knows that day is coming. And he knows the signs of the times probably better than we do. He has been at war with God and really with man from the garden. We, we know there are, are verses about Satan. And I'm not saying Satan himself possessed this man, but we know there are are verses about Satan being in the garden. And it would appear from the account in Isaiah, let me see if I can find it here. In chapter 14, verse 12, this is talking about the fall of Satan. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like 
the most high, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. We see the, the pride that, that came into his heart. He wasn't created in the image of God. But he says, I'll be like the Most High. There's an insinuation there of his jealousy over Adam, who was created in the likeness and the image of God. You know, we're, we're told in the New Testament that man is a little lower than the angels, just a little. But Adam wasn't. I don't think Adam was lower than the angels. I think Adam had an access to God that we don't have now, but we will one day. I get abilities to do things that we don't have anymore, but we will one day. I think Adam probably shone the glory of God before his fall which we don't anymore, but we will one day. This is where the real war is. Right? We're told in Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's our battle. Our battle is with him. That's what we wrestle with. Our, our wrestling is not against flesh and blood. Now, there's a lot of flesh and blood out there that have yielded to, have decided to, because of their own uh, their own willingness, their own desire to fulfill what they think is their need, their desire, or their, their having bought the lie that they themselves control their own destiny, they make their own life, they, you know, however they look at it, have set themselves above God or have decided that they have asked God to leave. They command God. But it's not ultimately that flesh and blood that we wrestle against. It's the motivation behind what they do and what they say. It's the motivator behind what they do and what they say. It is the enemy of God. It is Satan himself. It is the fallen angels, the demons. That's our our real battlefield. It's spiritual. It's not physical. Now, if God has chosen to use people like me and like you to stand in the way of any kind of progress the enemy would make, to establish his authority, to establish his dominion, his ownership of this planet, to show his strength, his power in us having victory over the enemy. And certainly the enemy will use whoever, whatever person is willing to rebel against God. Whether they know it or not. I'm not saying everybody out there is a Satanist. But everybody out there, everyone who's lost, who maintains that position, who wants to stay there, who wants to be in opposition to what the Bible says, has made themselves an enemy of God. We're not to go out and go to blows with those people. And, I, and I'm, 
I'm trying to say this without having to defend a whole lot of other positions to say it. But it's not the person who speaks the policies, the ideals, the influence, whatever. It's, it's not that person that I'm personally at war with. It is what either possesses them or motivates them. Not everybody on the other side, not every lost person, not everybody who is determined to be against God or determined to put God out, not every one of them is possessed. <clears throat> We're perfectly willing to be against God all on our own. Adam wasn't possessed. Adam fell all on his own. And as much as there was demonic influence before the flood, man was judged because of the wickedness of his heart. And again, men will be judged because of the wickedness of their heart. Even in the millennium, Satan and his, and his minions will be locked up for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. And it will still be rebellion against God, even with Jesus here on the earth, here, on his throne, here. And they'll still rebel. There will be people during that time that are born during that time that will still sin, that will still die in their sin in spite of him being here. So there is no, the devil made me do it. It is the lies that he perpetrates. It is the, the influence that he has over mankind. That's what we're at war with. Even in the church, it's the doctrine of demons that are taught by false teachers that we're at war with. It's not the man in the pulpit. It's, it, it's the, the demonic itself. It is that realm. To make it just about another man or another woman <clears throat> or myself takes God out of the war. We, we don't just dismiss the enemy any more than we're going to dismiss God. We need to understand, we need to truly understand, there is a supernatural here that we deal with on a daily basis. I told somebody today already, walking, just walking through, this has been a long morning already. This has not been a good morning for me. Started last night. It, this has not been a good 24 hours. Well, I shouldn't say 24 hours. This has not been a good 12 hours for me. How about that? Right up to forgetting to go out and feed my chickens and my ducks and getting dressed before I went out there. And then I had to go. Oh, I got to go out and take care of them anyways. Let the ducks out and I get mud all over me. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm trying to get everybody out the door. Now I got to go in and change. And it was just one thing after another. And it was little stuff. And I'm going, this is all just really little stuff. It's piling up, but it's just little stuff. And then I remembered what I had to teach. And I remembered what we were dealing with this morning. Now, I can't imagine that the disciples are all lined up like a bunch of gunslinging cowboys with Jesus ready to take this guy on. They're still shaken by a storm going to dead calm. Now you get out and now you got a, a demon-possessed guy. And, and when Jesus says, <clears throat> verse 8, he says, For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And he, then he asked him, What is your name? And he, or, and he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. I think they fell in line behind Jesus. 
which isn't a bad place to be. But, I mean, they've seen him deal with, with demonic people, right? They've seen him deliver people. They've seen him cast out demons already. I don't think this was... I think there was a little more to this than just the normal, hey, there's a crowd pressing in and Jesus said, you come out, you be healed, whatever was going on. And it was, I think it was more than that. I mean, here's a guy who's got a reputation for breaking chains. This isn't a group of guys holding somebody back and bringing him to Jesus and be able to pin him down. This is not somebody who's able to be pinned down. And a legion in their mind the, the picture would be a Roman legion, which at a, at a time of peace was 2,500 people, 2,500 soldiers. At a time of war, 6,000 or more. And when you heard the Roman legions were coming, fear came. Because they didn't stop. They plowed a path where they went of death and destruction. This was meant to intimidate everybody but Jesus. He didn't, now, here's what he didn't have to do. He didn't have to call out 6,000 demons. All right, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? Okay, you go. What's your name? You go. He didn't have to do that. Matthew says he just said, go. Go. And they went. He says, what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now, and it's Luke and says he he begged him that he wouldn't send him send them to the abyss to the bottomless pit ahead of time that we see in Revelation because they know it's not time for that yet you get the impression that that time in the pit that thousand years is not going to be anything pleasant for them This man, his life at this time, is one living among the dead. His home is in the tombs. He's living among the dead. And he's resistant to any kind of restraint. And he's always restless. He's running through the mountains. He's running through the tombs. He's in the wilderness. He's not at peace. This area had a, had a, a reputation for being one of idolatry. And so you, you can imagine this is a man who had a life before this that starts getting involved with things that he shouldn't. And now assuming, and I think we have to assume, and, and there's not, we don't know for sure if this is a Gentile man or a Jewish man, but assuming that he's Jewish because Jesus went to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. So assuming that he's Jewish, or assuming this is a Jewish village there, they're already dealing with things that they shouldn't. They shouldn't have pigs. If it's a Jewish community, they shouldn't be raising pigs. That was against the law of Moses all over the place. But maybe he gets involved in the idolatry. Maybe he gets involved with whatever other occult things that are going on around him just to play around. It's no big deal, right? It's all just fun and games I hear that about different things. Hollywood's more, I think this is the, 
the uh, kind of the, the beginning of Hollywood's interpretation of what a demonic, wicked entity can do. They crank out movies of and, and TV shows of things that cannot be restrained. They break chains. They break out of their prisons. They break out of whatever. And usually there's a good guy that, that ends up winning the, the day. And, and uh, usually. But, I mean, you know, you can't get Friday the 13th Part 20 without with the, with the bad guy dying all the time. There's a lot of you think you overcome, but you really don't. You know, it, it's out there. And, and I think you should stay away from those things. I know a lot of people go to church, oh, it's just a scary movie. Oh, it's not that big a deal. It really doesn't scare me anyways. It's all fake. I'm going to tell you what, it's influenced by something that's not fake. I think Stephen King has a pretty good insight into the demonic world to be able to write the books that he writes. I think it's ridiculous to feed your kids Harry Potter. Well, it's just, you know, it's just this. It's just not that big a deal. It's not real. No, nah, it is. It is real. Those particular stories may not be real but it has a basis in a real occult following and a real occult teaching I think we need to stay away from that kind of thing I think you need to stay away from a Ouija boards I think you need to stay away from all that stuff and if you listen to people around this community talk there's a lot of occult around this community A lot. From Native American practices to Wiccan stuff to all kinds of stuff that go on in and around this community. And it's funny because I think every community, every church that that is a Bible teaching, believing church thinks that their community is unique to all other communities because there's a lot of spiritual activity around our community. And what I think is a church that lives this and, and follows this has their eyes open to see what's going on. And they do recognize it. And I don't think it's unique. I don't think our community is any more unique than any other community in the world. Satan is very willing to put his practices into whoever for fun and games or for real damaging purposes. And when the church plays in it and dabbles in it and blurs the line between what is truly Christian and what is not, then the world can't know what is truly Christian and what is not. So we need to not be dabbling in that at any level. You know, people will say, well, what about, what about Tolkien's books? They got all the, all the spells and all the stuff in the back of the books and the appendix of the books, but he was supposed to be a Christian. Yeah, that stuff wasn't put there by him. My understanding is that was added later by other people. I don't know. I don't know that to be absolute truth, but that's that's my understanding. That's what I've heard. Listen, this is this is somebody who got wound up in the things of the world. If he's Jewish, he got pulled into the world away from Jehovah God. And he became one who was living among the dead. 
and one who is constantly resistant to restraint. Listen, 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 through 4 tells us that God's commandments, his restraint, are not a burden to us, but they are the way to victory over the world. His commandments are not burdensome to us. The world thinks it's a burden. The lost think that the commands of God are a burden. We don't. They're free. Our victory comes from following the commands of God. And we overcome the world. So he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So not out of the area. This is their area. Verse 11 says, Now a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountain. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. That's where Matthew says, he just said, go, just go. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And all those who fed the swine fled, and they told told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to sea. What was, or yeah, what was, what it was that had happened? And they came to Jesus and saw one, saw the one who had been demon possessed and had been, or had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. They, they're fearful in the storm. They try to bind this guy up. They try to, they try to keep him under control, and they can't. So everybody's afraid of him. But when they show up and he's sitting there, clothes on, he's not naked anymore. And in his right mind, the man who was restless is being still and at peace. People say, where did clothes come from? Probably from Jesus, probably from the disciples. Hey, they're on the road, right? They're they're traveling. Somebody, you guys have something. Peter, he's about your size. Come here. Give him your extras. And he's sitting there in his right mind. The transformation was obvious. He went from a man who lived in the tombs and was out of his mind and restless and now sitting at the feet of the one who would give life in his right mind, covered by him. And they were afraid. They're more afraid of the transformation than they are or than they were the one who was crazy. The one who was possessed. The one who was a danger. He said, and those who saw it uh, told him how it happened uh, to him or told how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from their region. When he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. So the demons beg, don't send us out of the area. Don't send us away. Don't send us to the abyss. 
And so he answers that prayer. He answers that request. They can't do anything without his permission anyways. They couldn't go into the swine unless they had the permission. They couldn't just leave the guy and leave Jesus' presence. Okay, well, we'll leave this guy alone, and we'll go over here. They, they couldn't even do that. Once he had shown up, they couldn't do anything without his, without his permission. Look, Satan can't do anything without God's permission. Look at Job. If you're, a, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you believe in God, if you believe in a, you need a redeemer like Job did. Job believed the same thing we did. He fully believed in the grace and mercy of God. So did David. So did Moses and Abraham and everybody else we saw in, in Hebrews chapter 11 when we were there. But if you look at Job, Satan had to have permission to touch Job. He couldn't do it otherwise. Before he goes to the cross. In Luke chapter 22. Jesus goes to Peter and says, Peter, Satan has asked for you. To sift you. But I've prayed for you. That's as good as God saying, Jesus saying, he can't have you. But I'm going to let him sift you. And when you come back to me, encourage your brothers. It's kind of a hint that you're all going to get sifted, but you're first in line. But he's asked for you specifically, Peter. But he had to ask. He couldn't just attack Peter. So the demons have begged, don't send us where we're, you know, to the abyss. Don't send us out of the country or out of the area. Send us to the to the swine. And so he says, okay, go. Now you have a whole city, a whole countryside coming to him, and they're freaked out because this guy who has scared them, who has been legend in his strength and the terror that he could put on people, the noises that he would make out in the forest, in the mountains. The fear that he would strike in the hearts of fishermen to stay away from their area even. And they see him, instead of embracing Jesus, instead of embracing God, they're like, get away. Go. Maybe you've had such a complete transformation in your life by God. It is such a complete, you are a 100% different person that you just freaked out everybody around you. If, if you read, again, I think I talked about the Harvest Book last week, but if you read the Harvest Book and the testimonies of the, of the first men who became pastors in Calvary Chapel, the transformation in some of their lives is so huge from the very beginning that it scared people. You know, Raul Reese is the first one that comes to my mind. Just so full of rage and anger and just, just has given over to everything. Sitting in his house, sitting in his apartment with a shotgun, ready to kill his wife and kids when they walk through the door, and then himself. And Chuck Smith comes on the TV and shares the gospel. That's all he hears. And Raw Reese's drops to his knees there in that apartment, gives his heart to the Lord. He knows that's the church that his wife was at. He left to go to the church to find her. Everybody was gone when he got there. When he came home, the doors locked for good reason. <laughs> Let me in. You're not coming in here. No, you don't understand. I'm born again. I, I gave my heart to the Lord. I don't know how long it took her to let Sharon to let him in. I can only imagine. And 
Maybe your life has been such a complete turnaround that you freaked people out. And they said, you know what? I, I, I can't. I can't handle you anymore. You're only talking about Jesus. I can't handle Mr. Goody Two Shoes or whatever they're calling you. I, I can't handle what he, I, I can't handle you being good. You don't want to party. You don't want to get drunk. You don't want to get high. I still do. So you go do your God thing. And when you're done with that, you can come back. We'll be here waiting for you when you're done. But you know you can't go back to that. Jesus has transformed your life into something new. And our our country, our country, we have some people fighting to have one nation under God taken out. And I'm not sure that that's that big a deal anymore because we're not really one nation under God anymore. We're more and more given over to the world. We're more and more given over to Satan. But I'd still fight to keep that on our, on our, on our stuff. I'm going to keep it in our pledge. Most people don't want you to pledge anything anymore. Our country has seen some amazing things that God has done. And I think it used to be safe to say, if you consider the majority of the country that we probably really were a Christian nation, we at least had a respect for the word of God. We had respect for the churches. We had respect for those who believed. Even if you didn't want to follow Jesus, the morality, all of that was important. We knew it, it made community strong. But now we're saying to God, get out of here. We'd rather have the demonic. We'd rather have the insanity. Leave. And when bad things happen, you're like, well, where's God? We thought you, you know. You know, you know what he did? He got in his boat and left. That's the entire world, though. It's not just our country. I think it's probably a pretty good assessment of Ireland talking to you. Right, Andy? Yeah. As a whole. It's a pretty good assessment of, of Great Britain. It's a pretty good assessment of Germany, of, of Russia, of Turkey. The churches that you see in, in, that are established by Paul, many of them are in Turkey. It's a pretty good assessment of Turkey, isn't it? Who told God to leave? And the entire planet is trying to tell him to leave. But there's a day coming when he takes that scroll that's talked about in in Revelation, he's going to start breaking the seals. And that scroll is, some scholars believe, designed or, or looks like in the image of, of a title deed back in that day. What a title deed would, be look, would look like because it's written on the inside and the out. He begins to break the seals. A title deed would be sealed up. And he's the only one that can break the seals open. And we've seen in Psalms, as we've been going through the book of Psalms the, the last couple of weeks, he's always held the title deed to this earth. And he's going to take it back. And he's going to set up his kingdom here. And then when it's all done and the last rebellion's put down, he's going to take what's his and he's going to destroy it. He's going to make a new heaven, new heavens, new creation, new earth, new Jerusalem. And all who've chosen him will be there. 
And all those who have rejected him will be in a place that was created for Satan and the angels that fell with him. So what are we doing? Are we telling him leave? I mean, he they begged him, leave, depart from us. So he got in the boat. And he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has com- had compassion on you. The only one who didn't get his prayer answered the way he wanted. The demons are begging for, just send us away from you. It would be better to be in the swine than be in your presence. As long as it's not the end. And and the the people from the area, just leave. You, you're too much. Just leave. All right, I'll leave. Take me with you. Just take me with you. I don't ever want to be out of your sight again. And to him, Jesus says, no, you can't come. You have to stay. And his disciples are going to hear this sometime later. Just before he goes to heaven, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to stay here in your life. You've you've given your life to my to me already. And that word witness in Acts chapter one is the same word we get the word martyr from. You're going to give me your life. Your your lives are mine. And you're going to go and you're going to give your life to to this. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to go to Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This guy just says, you just go home. I want you to go home. I want you to tell your friends the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. What are you telling them about Jesus? What are we telling them about Jesus? Is it all just, hey, if you quit, if you don't quit rebelling against God, you're going to hell. Maybe we need to change our tactics a little bit. I mean, I'm all about telling them about the end. That It's there. It's in the Bible. They need to know. They need to know what, they, what they're going to escape. I think it was Jude that says, we save some by fear. We tell them what they have to fear. But some of you guys, we need to just tell them hey, the great things the Lord's done for us. And let's not just go and tell people the great things that happened to you. Man, this is so awesome. I was, the parking lot was full on Black Friday, and I got a spot in the very front, right up at, by the door. Couldn't believe it just opened up. Ain't that great? I mean, attach Jesus to it? How many times have you been someplace... And you leave, and then something bad happens there. We had a a storm the other day. And I walked outside. We were leaving our friend's house, and and I just walked out, out and a branch blows out of the tree, hit their car, and hit me. It wasn't a very big branch. It was big enough to make me feel like I got punched in the shoulder. In fact, it hit hard enough, I was waiting for the rest of the weight to come. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was coming down. I think God protected me. I saw the aftermath of that storm the next morning when trees were down all over our little town. Big trees, split in half. Driving home in that storm waiting for the flashes of lightning so I could see if there was a, a funnel cloud somewhere I needed to avoid. Because it really, I thought, tornadoes here, man. The way the wind was blowing, it was weird. 
But what about this, man? God restored my marriage. When your friends come and say, man, this, my life stinks. My marriage is horrible. How about this? God restored your marriage. Let me tell you what you need. You need Jesus. Forget about all the self-help stuff and you got to talk to this and you got to talk about that and you got to respect this. How about this? You want to really get your marriage back on track? And I'm not promising you that God's going to even maintain your marriage, but hey, how about Jesus? It's the beginning place. Or how about if God's so great, why has this happened? I don't know why he let that happen. But if you want to have any clue to it, you probably ought to know God first before you start questioning him. Because he does great things. And that bad stuff you saw, that is a collaboration between man and Satan. That has nothing to do with God. Tell him. Tell him how he had compassion on you. Listen, this is what I know. I know I was going to hell. I know I was. I was a sinner. I was going to hell. And he saved me. And I know I'm not going there now. I know that when I asked him to forgive me, he did. Just like, was it Psalm 32 we went through on Wednesday night? David. My sin was in me. My sin was wrecking my life. It was wrecking my, my, my physical health. But when I asked him to forgive me, he forgave me. And I'm not going to be intimidated by who I used to be. I'm going to tell you and I'm willing to teach you the things of God. Verse 20 says, and he departed and he began to proclaim in Decapolis. That's 10 cities. There's 10 cities in that area. So he didn't just go home. He didn't just go home and just tell his friends. He went to the cities around that area. All that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. They couldn't handle being in the presence of Jesus. You need to leave. But this guy comes back, starts with family and friends and just says, hey, look at what he did. Look, I'm not trying to beat your door in anymore to get at you. I'm just knocking. Hey, let me in. See how that, I got clothes on. <laughs> yeah. Look, look at my eyes. My eyes have changed. Everybody marveled at the change because it was obvious. He didn't get to come to Jesus and just hang on to the old life and go back to running in the mountains and screaming and yelling and jumping out and scaring people. And, you know, he didn't hide in the tombs. And when when a procession came by, he jumped out and said, boo. He didn't even goof around with it. He left it all behind, the dead. He quit living among the dead and went and lived life for Jesus. We have to do that. We have to we just go back to the old life and just stay there and be stagnant. We get up and we move out from among the dead and we begin to live life. And we live life for Christ. The one who's given us life. The one who's restored things for us. The one who's built us up. And we may have things we look back and we get depressed sometimes or we... We see things that didn't work out quite the way we thought they would. And 
maybe maybe we 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 have a a scar. I mean, this guy is set and cut himself. Interesting, cutting's not a new thing. He cut himself with sharp stones. Doesn't say those went away. The scars. It was a reminder. There are some things from our past that are reminders. Some of it's distant past, some of it's not not that far back. But we have things there that are kind of more like scars that are reminders of what Jesus done for has done for us. And again, not everything works out, you know, like a Disney princess movie. But we walk with the Lord. We don't compromise that. We stay with him. We walk for him. When he sends us somewhere, we go. First, these guys, they're in a boat, and they get to see him in control of the natural. And as they're getting back in the boat, they see that he's also in control of the supernatural. Uh, These are two incidences in just a couple of hours that have driven home the fact that they are in the presence of God. So don't forget. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget who's changed you, who's forgiven you. Don't let your circumstances dictate your faith in Christ. You keep your faith with him. You Listen, I'm just like this guy. I want to go home. Most days, I want to go with you. Lord, just come and take me. And then you think, well, that's kind of selfish, isn't it? You leave behind everybody, leave your wife and your kids behind. Nope. No, that's not selfish at all. I'll, I'll be perfectly happy for everybody to go with me right now. We don't have to sing one more song. We don't have to cook. We can leave the hot dogs and hamburgers for somebody else. We could go home right now. I'm more than happy. Happy like you can't even believe and imagine. But for right now, we've been told we got to stay. For right now, we talk to our friends and our family and anybody else who will listen. And we tell them what, what, what the Lord has done for us and how he had compassion on us. We preach the gospel everywhere we go and make disciples until we go home. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for your encouragement. Lord, for giving us these pictures of who you are, that you are God of God. Lord, that you are just the great you are, the great I am. You encompass everything. Lord, we try to attach all these other titles to you, the provider, the healer, just you are God. You are I am that I am. Well, we confess that right now. You are the great God who's done so much for us and has had compassion on us. Lord, we want to tell everybody. We need to tell everybody. Lord, thank you for transforming us, for giving us a new life. Let us give us the strength, Lord, to be able to do what you're calling us to do. That we would not be intimidated by the world. 
We would not be intimidated by the enemy. We will not be intimidated by what you've saved us from, but Lord, that we would be motivated by you and full of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.